Hello and welcome to the uh, series of a few video on the topic of fluid mechanics. And I do realize this is a very physical, uh, physical subject and it's very touchy and I'm going to try and simplify it. And we can actually get an understanding of what's going on here instead of just going through the physics of it. So I am going to make it simple for you. And it's quite an interesting, fascinating subject that includes aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to get started with the explanation of what is a laminar flow and what is a turbulent flow. We're also going to explain how that relates to blood pressure measurements. And I'm only going through this because it could appear in your exam and it did appear in your lab work. Hopefully you remember that. And we're also going to review ideal versus real fluids. So let's get started. Now, as this image here, as this depiction here may suggest, laminar flow is that when uh, when all the layers, you can say that the, the fluid is layered and they're all kind of going parallel to one another. They're not smish-smashing across one another. They're not really interacting or they're not interfering with one another. And when I'm saying one another, I mean these layers here that are formed. These particles are flowing in these layers that are not disrupting one another. There's no mixing. But if you look at the turbulent flow, you can see that these particles are definitely in, in the way of one another. They're definitely uh, interfering and they're mixing and energy is wasted and there's, there's turbulence. And if you want to kind of kind of relate it to everyday life, if you take a faucet, if, if this is my faucet and I open it just very gingerly a little bit, I'm going to have a little bit of flow here, but it's going to be very laminar. But if I increase, I'm going to get a little bit of rippling here. And this is, this is really what, what I mean by turbulent flow. And as you can imagine, being that I opened and I introduced more fluid, you can say, for a given amount of time by opening, by opening this, this um, you can say, spinning this around here, then really uh, I can take a laminar flow and turn it into turbulent, turbulent flow by any, any of these means. I can either increase, increase the um, volumetric flow rate or the amount of fluid, amount of fluid, Let's just, let's just take a amount of fluid per cross section. I know this sounds section per time, per time. I know this sounds a little bit weird, but really what I mean is just turning the, the handle here a little bit more or and introducing more water that will flow through the faucet. This is really what I mean. This is volumetric flow rate. We're going to get to that a little bit later. So if you, if you don't fully understand that, don't worry about it. This will also be achieved. Um, by maybe squeezing, maybe squeezing this faucet a little bit, or if I had a hose, maybe squeezing the hose here is going to get these these flowing liquid uh, vectors here go flow a little bit faster on this side. We're going to touch on it a little bit later. So the radius radius of the medium definitely has uh, an implication whether or not this is going to be laminar or turbulent flow. And what I mean by that is, is if I take this medium here and I squeeze on it here, I'm obviously going to have way quicker flow here in the middle than if you look at this flow here. So it may, in the middle here, we may see some turbulent flow. And also the viscosity of the fluid, viscosity of the fluid does affect uh, the point at which we will see a turbulent flow. And I know this is not super intuitive yet, but just think of it this way. If you can turn this faucet to open a little bit more, you introduce more fluid per second, and then you will see this. Maybe you'll see some turbulent flow. But if for some reason you are able to stretch this faucet into having a, a wider opening, then maybe this turbulent flow is going to be laminar again. And where we would see this is in our blood. And before I get into blood pressure measurements, I really need to introduce two main topics. And those two main topics are, first of all, what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is the pressure that is exerted by the blood on the, uh, on the vessel uh, walls, you can say, the walls of the blood vessels. And there's two types of blood pressures. There's the, uh, the let's start with the systolic. Systolic blood pressure is when the, there's ventricular contraction. Ventricular contraction. I'm not going to go through the anatomy of the heart, but... Ventricular contraction is really the main event that we may expect because the ventriculars uh, are the, uh, or rather the left ventricle is the one that is going to pump the, uh, the uh, blood throughout the body. Uh, the right ventricle is going to pump it towards the lungs. So really, this is quite a big event. This is quite a big event and it's going to be associated with more pressure. And the 
diastolic pressure is when the ventricles are at rest. Ventricles are at, uh, are at rest, or you can say they're expanding, or blood is flowing towards the ventricles. This is really what diastole is. And let's just take a look at some sort of, let's just say, I measure someone's, uh, someone's blood pressure, and it's 120 over 80 um, millimeter mercury. Very good. We're not, I'm not really going to touch on this unit. You don't really need to understand it very much. But really what we're talking about and uh, really what we're talking about is that the systolic pressure is going to be considerably larger, so it's going to be this higher number, and the lower number is going to be the diastolic blood pressure. And really, why am I bringing this up? Why am I bringing this up? Because in the, we can, let's say I'm drawing a blood vessel here, and inside this blood, level, uh, le uh, blood vessel, I have some sort of laminar flow there's some sort of laminar flow. And you can imagine that I can, let's just say, I'm taking a cross section of this point here. Let's say I'm taking a cross section of this point here and I'm looking in and I have the cuff. This is the cuff that we use to kind of restrict the blood flow and measure it. And I have the cuff here and it's all around it. And maybe by blowing it up, I can squeeze more and more until I seal this shut. Let's just say I'm sealing it shut. There's no flow at all. There's no flow of blood at all. There's no flow at all. And if in that case, I ins insert my statoscope and I try to listen, what, what would I hear at this point? I'm not going to hear anything because there's no flow. There's no flow at all. And slowly, little by little, if I, if I, kind, of let, if I kind of let the air out, and slowly, little by little, there's, there's going to be a little bit of flow here. There's going to be a little bit of flow. This flow to, is not going to be laminar. This flow is not going to be laminar because the radius of the, you can say the medium, is now smaller considerably. So these all vectors are going to kind of push in. They're going to turbulent in here, and then they're going to get out here. And at this point, I'm really going to have turbulent flow because I took the radius, I took the radius of the medium and I dropped it down. So at this point, I'm going to actually hear a noise of turbulent flow. And if I open this a little bit more, if I let it go a little bit more, then you can imagine that if I'm going back to this point and there's, there's hardly any pressure at all and the blood vessel is at its original diameter, then I'm going to have, I'm going to have laminar flow again and I'm not real, really going to hear anything. So this is why we hear what we hear when we're measuring blood pressure. And really when you think about it, let's try, let's try and kind of give it some sort of some sort of quantitative measure. So let's see if we can make it work. I'm going to put pressure here, P for pressure, pressure, and let's just put the sound here. This is the sound, and let's try, I'm just going to draw it here a little bit. There we go, perfect. So at this point, the pressure, let's just say I increase the pressure, and it's above this systolic pressure. It's quite a lot, and that means nothing's going to get through. So if my pressure is greater than the systolic pressure, I'm not going to hear anything. Silence. I'm not going to hear anything. The blood flow stops. No blood flow. Now let's just say that the pressure here drops below this systolic pressure and between, really between these two numbers, then there's going to be some sort of blood flow. So if my pressure is is smaller than the systolic pressure and a little bit bigger than the diastolic pressure. I'm going to hear some sort of, I'm going to hear sounds of turbulent flow. So I'm going to hear some sort of oscillating, oscillating sound, oscillating sound, which really means there's some sort of turbulent flow, turbulent flow. And if the pressure drops below this pressure here, this diastolic pressure, if it drops below the diastolic pressure, then really blood is, can overcome the pressure and just flow as it used to before. So we're not going to hear anything. We're not going to hear anything. And this is just laminar, it's called laminar silence. Laminar silence. Because when there's laminar flow, there's no turbulence and there's no audible um, consequences to it. So basically what this means is that I can take any laminar flowing fluid through some sort of medium, squeeze on it, and cause some sort of turbulence. And hopefully this should make a little bit of a sense, a little bit. 
so hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. But we're going to move on. We're going to move on and talk about the differences between ideal fluids and real fluids. And I'm, and I'm really going to touch on the bare essentials that you need in order to answer some sort of questions and get an intuition. And an ideal fluid is really like an ideal gas. It means, let's just, first of all, there's no, there's no interaction between, between the different, uh, let's say, different liquid, liquid particles. And just like, just like ideal gas, you can say that if I have some sort of flow of ideal fluid, the different particles do not interact. They don't bounce off. They're not in the way of one another. It's some sort of liquid that doesn't really exist. It doesn't really exist, but it helps us get an understanding and maybe make some calculations, just like ideal gas calculations in chemistry. So there's no real interaction, or it's, it's futile or negligible, and also it's incompressible. Incompressible. And again, uh, fluids in everyday lives are not ideal. This is just a concept that helps us calculate, solve for, and understand in physics how fluid dynamics, how, how it works in essence. So what's important to understand is being that there's no interactions, there's no viscosity. Viscosity. And this is from everyday life. Like you would imagine, the viscosity is the resistance of a, of a fluid to, to be at motion or to move or to, to uh, migrate from one point to the other because there's a lot of friction between the particles. And if there's no interaction between the particles, there's no viscosity. So this is, this is pretty ideal. Very good. And as you can imagine, real fluid is the opposite. There is an interaction. There is, is inter uh, uh, particles are interacting. Particles are interacting. Interacting, which means there is viscosity. Viscosity. Vis uh, viscosity. Viscosity present. Or it's viscous. It's viscous. And it is somewhat compressible compressible to a certain extent. Not very, not very compressible like air, but uh, real fluids are somewhat compressible to an extent. And this is really the difference. And if you want to think about it, uh, what do you think blood is? Blood is a real fluid because we know that blood has uh, red blood cells, that red blood cells collide with one another. Maybe this slide, there's some friction going on. So really, this is what we need to know about real and ideal fluids. And the reason that I'm introducing this is we're going to talk in the next video about Bernoulli's principle that applies to ideal fluids. And this is really uh, what I'm going to mention. And don't worry about the uh, millimeter mercury here. You don't really need to know these units. Don't worry about them right now. All you need to know is that I can actually experience uh, turbulent flow if I decrease the radius of the medium I'm going through. And don't worry about the volumetric flow rate just yet. I'm going to introduce everything little by little. So I will see you in the next video.